All right, everybody, uh, it's Mike here with Hardware Canucks again. And as you get to know me a little bit more, you're probably gonna realize that when I see some of the videos that we put out, I wanna do something a little bit different with them. Uh, and that's sort of take it to the next level. And that's where this video comes in. And this video is about, uh, let's call it an A500 Redux. This is the Corsair A500 air cooler. And we found some pretty glaring issues with Corsair's claims that it was rated at 250 watts. But that also got me thinking. We identified a bunch of areas that Corsair could have improved. So I wanted to take that to the next level and try a couple of the theories that we had and a couple of the fixes that we and you guys came up with in this video. So let's get to that right after a message from our sponsor. Looking for the coolest RTX 20 series GPUs? Oris has you covered with their efficient WinForce stack cooling system along with a gorgeous RGB ring illumination, an IO that's jacked for the most flexible multi-monitor setup and the ability to experience ray tracing for current and upcoming games. Learn more down below. So guys, after testing this cooler, Eber and I, we noticed that there was three major areas where Corsair could have improved things. One of them was the base finishing quality. Another one was that there's a void in between Corsair's two fin arrays that could be causing some airflow problems from one area of the cooler to another. And finally, there was the fans. The fans we sort of addressed in that original review by replacing them with Noctua's. But it's actually the first thing that I wanted to talk about in this video. With those Noctua fans installed, we actually saw a pretty significant performance increase, but we really wanted to take things to the next level. And that meant addressing Corsair's brackets. While these brackets look really good and they function amazingly, a lot of you guys noticed, and we noticed too, that there's a small lip around the bracket that means that the fans don't make direct contact with the heatsink itself. What that can cause is a loss of airflow if it tends to flow around the heatsink instead of going through it. Corsair sort of took care of that by adding a baffle, but I wanted to see what would happen when we put those Noctua fans directly up against the heatsink and avoided Corsair's brackets altogether. So my idea with all of this is really to go for a cheap and cheerful approach. And because of the fact that Corsair really doesn't allow you to mount any other fan onto here, other than ones that use their own brackets. And trust me, we've tried brackets from Noctua, we've tried brackets from Be Quiet. Nothing else works on here because of the rail system. So cheap and cheerful, we're gonna be using just some regular zip ties. It's not gonna be pretty, but it's gonna work just so we can get some benchmark numbers. I hope these don't melt. One of the problems is that there isn't much space in between the, the heatsink fans. So first one, are we gonna get in? Yes. Yeah, it's not bent at all, is it? I can't believe this. That cooler is not, that fan is not coming out. No, they, this is like right up against there. And it's equally spaced everywhere, which is perfect. The first phase is done. And that's to strap on a, these Noctua fans. It looks really bad, but at this point in time, we're just going for that flush mount. And we got as flush as we could. Now the last thing is to really install this into there and see if this gives us any improvements. If it does, we just keep these on and we move on to the next step. So we're done with the two Noctua fans flush mounted and the results are a little bit confusing, but I'm going to explain them. So first of all, on the stock settings at 1000 RPMs, we only saw about a two degrees Celsius difference and that's well within the margin of error. But then when we go to the overclock settings, this thing still gets completely completely overwhelmed by the thermals put up by the processor. The flush mount fans did not do a thing. All right, on to phase two. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to take a fan and put it into this void. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to take a Noctua NF-A9 fan and sort of put it in there. The problem is that this fan is your standard 25 millimeters thick. And for whatever reason, Corsair made this opening right here 23 millimeters. So we had to sort of like move on and looked at our fan collection and this is the uh, A9 X14. And it's just a slimline fan. It doesn't have the same kind of static pressure rating or anything. All right, it, it took us about a, a half hour to figure this out and, and we needed to find a way to not hang this thing, but actually make sure that it's flush mounted, this direction actually, because the airflow is going that way that it is flush mounted, drawing hot air in from this side and continuing that to the exhaust. The only way that we really found to do that is, well, I just happen to have some of this in my garage. Um, it's metal wire, and at least it's not gonna melt because I'm pretty sure this thing's gonna get very, very hot. So 
We're going to thread it through uh, the holes and the size of the heat sink. Hope for the best. And on the other side, well, you're probably going to see me having a couple of cut fingers and a little bit of swearing, but let's hope it works. So let's try it. All right, so it worked. Well, the fan's installed, only one cut. So this is what it looks like. So there's two pieces of metal wire and then there's two shims further down there so the fan doesn't go all over the place when it starts actually working. So the idea here is to draw in air from one side and quickly draw it out of this dead zone into the other so it gets exhausted outside the case. Question is, will it work? So we're done the testing and the results, well, they weren't quite what I was expecting. With the third fan installed, we didn't really see a drop in temperatures in any way, shape or form. But if you drill down into the results and the logs that we took, it took a lot longer for the heatsink to reach that temperature with the third fan installed. So instead of it taking about 10 minutes, it took about 20 minutes for it to reach the temperature that, that we saw. But moving on to the overclock results, again, there was absolutely no difference. This is with three fans moving at 2000 RPMs, but I had a little bit of a hunch. So I took out this FLIR camera right over here and I did a couple of little analysis and you can see the pictures here. The heatsink is actually cool to the touch. And that's really weird, but it tells us a lot. That tells us that the heat from the processor isn't making it up through the heat pipes and into the fin array. So that can mean one of two things. One is that the base isn't making proper contact, but we've already seen that we're gonna address that. And the other possibility is the fact that there just isn't enough heat pipes to efficiently conduct the heat from the processor upward. So what's the next step that I wanted to do? Well, it's actually the one that I should have done at the very beginning, because as you can see, I had to take this whole thing apart because in order to demount the cooler, this third fan can't be in the middle. I'm basically gonna take this kit of sandpaper that goes from 400 grit all the way up to 3000 grit to lap the heatsink base. It's been, my goodness, it's been like 13 years since I've tried to do this and I know it's gonna be one hell of a process, but I wanna see if we can actually get that heat transfer a little bit better. How's it going? Uh, it's going pretty good. So I have my lapping station set up here, a uh, wet dry sandpaper, making sure that I have some water relatively close. And I noticed something really interesting here. As, as I was lapping, I started at a little bit lower grit, so 320, because as you can see right here, just gonna take some of that off. Right now, material is being taken off the bottom of the heat sink, but because this heat pipe was a little bit torqued in one direction, it's only coming off right over here. So my goal right now is to try and sort of whittle this down and make sure that this is no longer there as I get on to higher and higher grits of sandpaper to try and get a little bit of a smoother base. Two, three, four. I need, I need like wine or something to do this. Maybe a whiskey, because this is nuts. Then again, if with whiskey, I'd be like this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, final update. This is where we stand. So bring it in, Eber. You can actually see that I have this little arrow point towards the area that there was a problem. But uh, I went all the way up to 3000 grit and you can actually see that, yes, it is pretty mirror based, but I want to explain this area right here too. See that? That is an area that there's an issue with one of Corsair's heat pipes and there's a very, very like micrometer curve to it. And that's why it has been polished down. But right now, this is smooth as a baby's butt. So uh, I think we're gonna take this to the test bench, cross my fingers that I haven't taken off uh, too much material because if not, then the mounting mechanism probably won't work, but uh, let's go check it out. After two hours, it's better work, man. And did it work? Well, yes and no. And I'm gonna be brought back to something from, uh, from my grade school. One of my teachers said to me, you have to uh, fail sometimes to succeed. So in this case, I spent two hours of my time and all this testing, and in the stock results, we got amazing temperatures. These are 12 degrees cooler than Corsair's stock results. So Corsair, if you're watching right now, we fixed your cooler, at least for 165 watt TEP. But when we go above that and we went into overclocking, we didn't see one difference. And I think my original theory was correct. And that was to say that there just aren't enough heat pipes transmitting the heat from the processor into the fins. So where do we go from here? And we're gonna stick to our conclusion. And that is, we're not gonna recommend the A500 for high TDP processors. 
it should not be rated at 250 watts. And sort of shame on Corsair for doing that. I don't know where they got that number from. With that being said, instead of wasting your money and your time like I did, um, to fix something that shouldn't be broken in the first place, I'm just gonna say look at something from Noctua, look at something from Be Quiet, if you're running a very, very hot chip. So I guess that's pretty much it. I had a ton of fun doing this. The results were a little bit mixed, but uh, I'm Mike with Haro Canucks. Uh, I, I'm probably gonna see you in the next crazy video like this. Uh, Ibru's behind the camera, he says uh, bye too, and I'll see you in the next one. See ya. Beep. Here we go. Good? Okay, good.